Hello and welcome to The Property Show. I'm Andrew Montplake and with me is my co-host, Louisa Fletcher. We're here to talk about all things property. So whether you're staying put, buying, selling, renting or letting, we'll be chatting through the latest news on the housing market and mortgages, as well as sharing our advice and expertise to help you get the best from your home. In today's show, Lou will be talking about rising house prices and explaining why sometimes sellers should be cautious about accepting offers over asking price. Plus, Monty will be answering the age-old question about how much you can afford to borrow, as well as sharing his pick of the latest mortgage products. We're here to help you make money, save money, and most importantly of all, protect yourself, regardless of where you are on your home ownership journey. You all ready, Lou? Like a sausage on a bank holiday barbecue, Monty. Hello, hello, hello. Lou. <laughs> like, well, talk me through the sausage <laughs> on a bank holiday barbecue. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, I do wait every every episode for whatever the hell you're going to say there, and uh, I, I got I got to admit, I didn't expect that one. Yeah. See, bit of creativity today. It's just been one of those days. <laughs> <laughs> Is that wishful thinking for the, the the next May bank holiday where you're going to yeah. be? I do, love, Barbecuing. I do love a good barbecue. I really have missed like barbecues in general, you know? So yeah, yeah. that's my thing. Yeah. Good. I, 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 nice I'm laughing because I've literally just stopped myself saying something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> family but, show, Monty. Family, family show. show. Family show. So um, you've been a busy girl today. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. hear that you just about scraped in on a deadline for your article before we started recording oh don't tell my lovely editor lauren but yes Uh, i think i think think you just have yeah yeah. yeah. there nearly there nearly was there nearly was a bit of a dog ate my homework situation about about 10 minutes ago but it's okay now so it's all fine yes have you got a dog no i didn't think so no (laughs) so go on then what were you writing about (laughs) um so, funnily enough, it was about house prices. Was it? <laughs> what are the chances? <laughs> I know. Um, yeah. So, um, a bit of a bit of data out from the lovely folk at the Halifax today. Latest house price ah. index. Yeah. Um, They've been on fire at the moment. Well, I'll, yes. I'll talk to them about. I'll talk to you about them later. Yeah. Well, yes. Um, so, go on. Talk to me about. Um, What's been happening with the the house price data from from the good old Halifax? Then? So, I think on fire is probably um, yeah, it's about right. I mean, it's a very very hot market, and mm. um, so the latest figures are suggesting that, uh, of course, this is kind of UK average, but there has been month on month growth of one point four percent. Um, which takes us to a year-on-year um, rise of, on average, 8.2%. So wow. comparing this April with last April, yeah. um, which is the highest annual rate of growth for five years. Mm. And I think the bit that really kind of, this gives context to all of it, because, you know, you can talk about percentages, but, you know, what does that really mean, right? Yeah. Um, but Russell Galley, who is the Managing Director of Halifax, said in the covering piece of commentary, and I quote directly, in cash terms, almost £20,000 has been added to the value of the average home since the market had essentially come to a standstill in April 2020. That's very interesting. There it is. And, Lou, pop quiz. Yes. What is the maximum saving on the stamp duty holiday? What, right this minute now? Yeah. Yeah. That would be fifteen of your English pound, fifteen thousand of your English thousand so, pounds, Monty. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So therefore, yeah. So you It really has. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really has. The, the the rise in prices has sort of negated the um, stamp duty holiday. Yes, there it is. There it is in kind of you know in evidence yeah. there in the evidence bag. So yeah. Um, so it's frankly all a bit bonkers. One would suggest, but you know, hey, that's that's the world we're living in at the moment. So yeah, um, that is true. And, and I, um, yeah, what was interesting is that I think you're going to talk about something that 
that sellers should be aware of in these sorts of market conditions? So, yes, it's something actually you and I have been chatting about kind of for mm. ever since this has really kind of kicked off. And it's something we've been saying between us that we would sort of cover. And I just thought, you know, today with those, you know, um, house price stats that have been released literally the day that we're recording today, Monday, I thought, you know what, it's the right time to have the chat. So yeah. what we're going to talk about this evening is mortgage down valuations mm. and if that sounds like something that as a seller you don't have to worry about I'm kind of here to tell you that it is something that you really do need to consider when you're accepting offers potentially from maybe sort of two or more competing buyers mm. yeah this is something we've been you know we deal with it off and on quite mm. a bit, but but there's quite a bit recently. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to get your take on it. I, I was going to say, I suspect that this is something you feel the pain of on a relatively regular basis at the moment, Once, um, Yeah, it's more regular than it, it has been for a while, definitely. Mm. So, shall I just sort of, you know, and jump in, because of course you're the mortgage expert here, but should we just explain what a mortgage down value is to start with? Because I think, you know... Unless you know it, yeah. you're not going to know, right? So a mortgage down valuation is when you as the seller have accepted a price from a buyer, okay? You're both really happy. You as the seller, because you've accepted a really good price for your property, potentially over the asking price. And the buyer is really happy because they've secured the home of their dreams, the property they've fallen in love with. Um, estate agent, obviously very happy because he's got a sale. So everybody happy. So conveyancing process starts, and then at some point, if the property is being purchased with a mortgage, there will be a mortgage valuation appraisal, which is when the mortgage lender sends somebody out, a surveyor, to value the property to ensure it's worth what the lender is going to lend you. Have I got that right so far, Mons? I, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. So, Do you want a job? No. <laughs> I don't know, might do. So at this point, the mortgage the valuation is conducted on behalf of the mortgage lender because what they're doing is making sure that the money they're about to lend you, you know, the property is worth that amount of money. And this is where sometimes in an overheated market, this situation occurs. So the surveyor mm -hmm. will come out, they will appraise the property. And if they feel that the price that you've agreed as the buyer with the seller to purchase at is a little bit over where it should be, then the surveyor will report back and say, actually, I don't believe the property is worth the amount that, that you've agreed to pay for it. I believe it's worth this amount, which would be lower. And that, listeners, is what's called a mortgage down valuation. So at this point, yeah. your mortgage lender is now saying, you may have agreed to pay that amount of money for it, but we're not going to lend you that amount against it. Yeah. So, so if you're borrowing, say, seventy five percent of five hundred thousand, say, and the valuation comes in at four hundred and fifty thousand, the lender can only lend you seventy five percent of four hundred and fifty thousand. So it leaves people in a bit of a quandary, really, because yes. Yes. there are two, there are a couple of things that they can do. They can either um, try and overturn that valuation and the stats for overturning a valuation mm, I was going to say successfully are very very low mm, mm. and you really need to have evidence so what valuers will normally ask for is three comparable bits of evidence of comparable properties that have sold recently that would justify a higher valuation and that's normally quite tough because you have to remember that although stuff might be in the pipe and selling, it may not have actually completed and they're going to need to see the completed valuation as evidence. Mm. So it's, a, it's an interesting one. and we, we do see it a lot and it, it, does get, it does get frustrating because on the one hand, isn't a property worth what someone wants to pay for it or is willing to pay for it so you could sort of argue that if you're if you're in a busy market like now and you've got two or three potential buyers 
and one of them offers more than the others because and more than the asking price even because they want the property then in their heads isn't the property worth that but then you can look at it in the reverse yeah. and think well actually it's a bit dangerous paying mm-hmm. over the odds for a property because if house prices do call you could potentially a 75% mortgage could suddenly be a 85 or 90% mortgage and i think that that's that's the bit that's really important for buyers to bear in mind you know you might not be thinking about selling this property for 10 or 15 years however you probably will have to remortgage in maybe 2 maybe 5 years and that's where stuff could get interesting if you've overpaid now and then prices come off the boil in between mm-hmm. so there is you know there's obviously reason for this and you know as we're going to talk about in a minute actually about affordability and you know what you can afford to get on a mortgage and stuff you know the the lending rules that were introduced 7 years ago are there for a reason they are to ensure that nobody you know basically takes out a mortgage that they can't afford or could put them at risk not only is it not great for the buyer it's not great for the seller either especially mm. if you're selling this property to buy something else and you're in a chain correct now before i ask you what your top tips are <laughs> just for any valuers listening who might be angry at this point they would they would say look there's no such thing as a down valuation we're not downvaluing it. We're just giving you our honest opinion of what we think it's worth now. Yes. And it's, so, pro- and it's important to say we think surveyors are very lovely people. <laughs> <laughs> I've, actually, to well, be fair, I've, I've, I've yeah, never met a surveyor are, I don't get on with. I think surveyors are a jolly good bunch, actually. They're the undersung yeah. heroes of the property world in many cases, I find. There you go. I there find. You go. I'm going to keep, keep my piece on them. that. Yeah. Most of them are very good. Yeah. I think what what I, what I what drives us all mad is where you can't actually communicate with a valuer. Mm. So where you can actually speak to them and understand their point of view, that's fine. But I think sometimes there should be more communication, and I think valuers are sometimes a little bit too protective. They do a tough job. It is difficult. It is a tough job. It is quite yeah. subjective, mm. and in most cases. They d- they get it right. Mm. I'm no expert. They 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 know. But um, but anyway. So so tell us your your bits of advice for for sellers in this situation. So I'm going to give you three bits of advice on this. The first is going to sound slightly counterintuitive, but I would recommend that sellers don't always go with the highest offer especially if that offer is over the asking price. And instead, chat through with the estate agent, the buyer's situations, and look at who's got the biggest deposit, okay? Mm. Now, the reason I say this is because the less that the buyer is borrowing against the value of your property, it's, it's likely that their lender will be less concerned about negative equity. Mm. Therefore, you are less likely to be on the receiving end of a mortgage down valuation. The second bit of advice I've got is not to assume that the mortgage surveyor will understand the local market in your area. Because you have to remember, there aren't actually that many surveyors in the UK. So they do all cover quite a wide patch. Um, So do make sure that your estate agent provides local market trend comparisons as well as price comparables. So what we're saying here is not just, here you go, Mr. Surveyor, here are three or four other properties similar to this one, okay, that have sold for a similar price. What, what What we're talking about is, you know, showing hyper local which is kind of estate agency speak for four or five roads either side of the property that you're currently selling. And and you're looking for examples of where, you know, properties have been sold in excess of asking price as, you know, within the last sort of six to six to 12 weeks. So what you're evidencing here is the fact that properties in a very local 
space are going for higher than their asking price, as well as what properties similar to the one that you're selling are going for. So that's really important. That gives you the evidence to substantiate how you're achieving this price. And then the third thing I would say is don't plan your onward move based on the price that you've achieved. So especially, again, if you've achieved over asking price, just temper your budget slightly and work your numbers back based on taking 5% off the asking price you've achieved in case you end up with a mortgage down vow. Now, the reason for that is because if the mortgage approval you know, it goes through and if the valuation stacks out and, you know, happy days, that's great. You're actually going to be slightly ahead of the game and your budget will all work out okay. But if you predicate an onward purchase based on, you know, exceeding your asking price and then something doesn't quite work out that 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 could create a problem for you so there, there are a lot of factors here and that's why just a bit of caution and pragmatism even though it's really exciting when somebody says I'll pay you more than you want for your house because let's face it right who's not going to be excited when they get that phone yeah, call yeah. um but just kind of taking a beat and just making sure that you know you really understand what that could entail it could save quite a bit of heartache and stress. Mm. Yeah, that's quite interesting, that last point. I've, ne- I've never really thought about that, actually, in terms of just being a little bit flexible in your budget. That's, that's yeah, I like that. So it, this is one of these, ask me how I know this, because it's happened to me situations. Mm. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, that that was years ago in the last housing boom, and now we're kind of seeing you know, similar, similar happening now. And probably, you know what, Monty, maybe in the next episode, we should probably talk about that, the G word. I think that could be another one we need to cover off kind of soon. The gazumping word. Yeah, gazumping. That's, um, that's definitely something where we haven't seen masses amounts of it, but we're definitely seeing things like sealed bids. Mm. Um, as I think I said in in a, a couple of weeks ago, you know, property went on the market and they had something like twenty six viewings in in one weekend and and about five offers. So the market is red hot. Mm, it and, really is. And stuff like this is happening. So you know, if it's that we don't want to sound as though we're pouring cold water on your property selling dreams, folks. But all we're trying to do is just kind of give you the skills and and knowledge so that you can understand and interpret this in the right way for your own circumstances. So hopefully we take a little bit of stress out of what's going on for you. There you go. We're all about taking the stress out of stuff. All about taking the stress out of it, Monty. <laughs> uh, just a reminder, you're listening to The Property Show with Louisa Fletcher and Andrew Montclake. Now, Monty, we've got another mahoosive subject that mahoosive. we've been... Mahoosive. Um, that we've been saying we're going to chat about for ages. Um, and probably in the context of like, you know, the house price staff and what we've just been talking about, again, it kind of, it felt today's a really good day to, to cover it. Um, so it's the big question, right? How much can I borrow? Ah, that one. Yeah. Yeah. One. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, as a, as a mortgage broker, obviously that's, well, that's the number one question, isn't mm-hmm. it? That mm-hmm. everyone asks. Mm-hmm. And it used to be so simple to work out, didn't it? You know, back in the good old days. <laughs> back in the good old days. <laughs> all the bad old days. Yeah. Um, yeah. Depends on your view of things. Um, yeah, it, it did. Uh, and it was, It was. it's quite interesting to see where this has all gone. So it used to be the case that basically, if anyone asked me that question, I'd say, well, we, you can borrow between four and five times your income. There you go. And that was it. And that was basic income plus, um, on average, around 50% of any bonuses you get um, times by four to five times. That that was basically it. Now, what changed was in um, the mortgage market review back in 2014, which basically changed the nature of affordability. And that's where lenders had to look into more forensic detail in terms of what people were earning and what they were spending 
rather than just saying, oh, we'll lend you four times your income or five times your income, or back in those days, even six times your income. Wow. So it came to the point where they started to look at affordability generally and look at things like a budget planner. So one of the things we do with our clients, one of the first things we do is we go through a budget planner with them. And that's where we understand exactly how much money you've got coming in. So net income coming in and then what you spend each month. So what do you spend on utility bills? Do you have any loans or student loans? Do you have any credit card debts or school fees Uh, and the general cost of living? So all of that stuff now is taken into account and every single lender will have an affordability calculator. Wow. So and stuff now, like school fees and childcare and stuff, that that I think this is the bit that some people are quite surprised about. That they you know, it all counts right. All it all means basically, you know, how much money have you got that you can afford once you've kind of cleared all your bills to spend on a mortgage, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it does make sense. Mm-hmm really. Um, And what's interesting is if you now put your details in to 10 different affordability calculators, guess what? You get 10 different answers. See, that's not really that helpful, is it, really? Well, (laughs) each lender will have their own ways of looking at things. Okay. So some will take into account actually what's... um, what's their general cost of living allowance. Actually, they'll use their own figures or they'll use the standard state figures, the ONS data, or they'll actually take into account, some people will take into account a certain proportion of your credit card bill. Some will take, um, some will ignore certain things. If you say you're going to pay them off in the next three or six months, others will not ignore them even if you say you're going to pay it off so there's all these different little ways that lenders look at things and they've got their affordability calculator based on their historic data that they hold so they know which types of clients are more likely to if they've got credit cards and they say they're going to pay it off they actually know that that they're probably more likely to, as soon as they've paid it off, take out more credit card debt. Right, okay. So it's all based on little experience. The funny thing is, Lou, that when you look at it again and all those figures come back, it tends to be around about four to five times your income. Right, okay. (laughs) So, 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 So it is quite interesting. As a rough rule of thumb, I'd still say that. Now, obviously, if you've got children, if you've got three children and you've got some loans and school fees, you're going to be able to borrow less than if you're joint income, no kids, no debt. So that's That's what I was going to ask you. Absolutely the point. So is there a general, allowing for everything that you've just talked through, is there a general rule of thumb that says a person applying on their own might get four times income and a couple might get five times income or is it round the other way or is there or is there no rhyme nor reason no there's it's it it tends to be about the same really it does depend on the background so Mm. so most lenders now will go up to four and a half times your income and that's single or joint income okay so it doesn't make any difference Yeah. yeah yeah there are some lenders who will go to five times and there are some lenders who will go to five and a half times in certain circumstances. Um, but that's a maximum cap now. Mm. That's not an automatic. That's mm. if affordability says you can afford seven times income, say, for argument's sake, actually the maximum we'll lend is five times anyway. Okay. Okay. Um, and then the other thing to bear in mind is five year fixed rates. Okay. So what why also is that? came in. Yeah, what also came in was stress testing. Dude, seriously, so I mean, wasn't... like, I'm all about the stress testing. You ask me about stress <laughs> testing today, and I'm going to give you a very different answer. <laughs> Not that type of stress, Lou. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so lenders also have a duty of care to analyse not just can you afford it now, but can you afford it in the future if interest Absolutely. rates Absolutely, yes, exactly that, by, yeah. By yeah. about 3%. Yeah, 
and that's over a five-year period. So if you take a two-year fixed or a two-year tracker or, or variable rate or something like that, you'll be stress tested on that basis. Okay. So it might mean that you can borrow a little bit less. However, if you take a five-year fixed rate or longer, they don't have to do that stress test because the stress rate is done on the rate itself because rates aren't going to change for five years if you take a five-year fix or seven years if you take a seven-year fix or 10 years if you take a 10-year fix. So actually, some people are finding that if you take out a five-year fixed rate, your borrowing capacity increases because mm. of that stress test rule. Okay. And does and does that also, and I'm actually I genuinely don't know the answer to this, so it will be interesting to see what you say. Does this kind of five year stress test um also kind of assume that house prices will go up in that period so that, you know, there is a, there is this kind of counterbalance that you might have more equity in five years? Is that what anything does that have any difference at all? That's a good question. I don't. Because, you know, you'd odds it, right? So. You'd odds no. it that maybe house yeah. prices might have edged slightly upwards in five years. I don't know. I heard something not long ago where actually if you take any five year period and look at house prices, house prices will always be higher after five years. It does feel about right, I have to say. Hmm. Mm. Because remember, a lot of people get caught up with this house price data and negative equity and, mm. oh, house price is going to crash, etc. But as I've always said, housing is a long term mm. thing. Yeah, it's medium really good to point. long term. Really good point. And it's only yeah. an issue if you need to sell. Mm. If you just buy the house that suits you mm. at the time it suits you and you do what they're meant for, live in it, build your dreams. Mm hmm have fun, build mm. your memories. When it comes to sell, you should be okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. But we know from history, unfortunately, that sometimes it doesn't quite work like that. And you get back into the discussions we had last time about mortgage prisoners and yeah. what happened in certain places where you had 100% mortgages and 125% mortgages. Yeah, crikey. Yeah. If there's no real house price inflation, then you're stuck and that's part of the problem. Mm. Mm. So I guess what we're saying is that, you know, and we can completely understand why people feel frustrated when they're told they maybe can't borrow as much as they perhaps thought or need to borrow to buy the property that they mm. would love to. The, the reasoning behind this is that, you know, there was some bad stuff that, that kind of happened and went down during the credit crunch. And this is kind of protecting people from that happening again. Exactly. It, it really is. It's about lending responsibly. Mm. And that's what it's all about. And if you're assessing affordability and you can, you're in a good job, you've got good career prospects, you, you haven't got much debt and you can comfortably afford the loan, then you can borrow more. Mm. If you're stretching yourself and you're not leaving yourself any room to manoeuvre at all, then it's likely that a lender might look at it and go, actually, do you know what? I don't think you can borrow that much. Mm. Um, mm. And it's really important because we don't want the same thing to happen again as, mm. as it happened about, you know, 10, 12 years ago, yeah. where people really over borrow mm and cause some issues mm. and sometimes the sensible decision is to say do you know what I'm going to wait mm. and I'm going to make sure I am in a yeah. position where I can really afford it especially now when you're in a red hot market and people are desperate to get on the housing ladder and take mm. advantage and as we've just seen the the whole idea of the stamp duty holiday is a bit of an irrelevance really yeah. given the way house prices are yeah. So maybe if you if you feel and, and we as brokers do turn people away where we don't think that actually it's sensible for them to stretch themselves that much. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, the questions and the guidelines are there for a reason. So, mm. you know, if, if you're hearing you can't quite get the amount that you need, folks please take it from us it's it's not personal it's just you know 
the no, banker actually it's... ironically trying to look out for your best interests. It may not feel that yeah. way, but that's kind of what it's intended to do. And what I would say is, you know, if if you've just gone direct to your lender, then it might be that actually speak to speak to a broker who's got access to the whole market. And there mm. might be other lenders who can maybe they they can help you or you can they can look at things in a different way. Mm. Um but everything will be done within the realms of sensible lending. But in answer to your question, how much can I borrow? It's about four to five times your income. That's awesome. Thank you, Monty. <laughs> it's good. I'm glad that we've managed to talk about that because we've been, you know, people ask all the time. So it's good to yeah, yeah, good to get it out there. You're listening to the Property Show with Monty and Lou. So. We, do you know, we've nearly done this again. We're nearly out of time again. We are, aren't we? I don't know how this happens. Yeah. I really don't. Um, no, you keep talking. Well, you know. <laughs> getting away. Getting away. Um, so just very quickly, have you got a couple of special rates that you've fallen in love with this week? Anything you want well, to share? Well, you know what? We talked about the Halifax earlier. We did. And they are on fire. Because um, they've reduced... They've reduced their rates now. So through Halifax, you can get a two-year fixed rate at 1.04% now. Wow. Or a five-year fixed rate, they've taken it down to 1.22%. Wow. Although you have got £1,499 arrangement fee on that. And what sort of deposit does does one have to put in to get these A 40% deposit. 40%. Okay. So that's those those are the best rates. Wow. So we, we have seen ninety percent mortgages um come down slightly. So mm-hmm. you know, Clydesdale you can get two point eight nine percent two year fix, um or a five year fix three point two nine percent with wow. nationwide. Okay. So you know, they're still around the just around the three just under or just over the three percent level. Um and the 95% mortgages are still where they were a couple of weeks ago. So there's there's a lot of choice back in the mortgage market again. That's which really is, good. Which That's is good, really for, good consumers. for consumers. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, so it's there all, you go. It's all going in the right direction, isn't it? That's that's really, really good to hear. Yeah. The next conversation is um, how long will rates stay this low? And that's a topic for another time. That's a topic for a whole other day. <laughs> our, our crystal balls out yeah once it's family show family show and family on that bombshell <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much lou always a pleasure thank to you have for you having on me. this um balmy monday night yes um and thank you all for listening in again if you like what you hear please give us a rating or leave us a review in your podcast app And don't forget, we're here to help with your property problems and mortgage dilemmas. So if you'd like our advice, why not drop us an email to hello at theproperty-show.co.uk. And if you want the very latest on the property market from the two of us, please give us a follow on social media. You'll find us on Twitter at The Property Show Pod.